on this edition of Around BCC. Student activism at BCC is more organized than ever. BCC makes a concerted effort to meet the needs of the disabled. Our alumni profile looks at graduates who are now husband and wife. And our students preview an upcoming TV club event. Welcome to Around BCC, I'm Keith Tebow. It's full steam ahead at all the campuses of Bristol Community College as our spring semester is well underway. Student activism has long had a presence on college campuses, but its form has changed. It's now organized and focused. And here at BCC, it's tailored to the interests of students. Students at Bristol Community College have always been interested in having their voice heard across the political landscape. For over 30 years, the Massachusetts Public Interest Research Group, or MassPerg, has been the liaison for students to organize. BCC MassPerg coordinator Kavitha Gurather says MassPerg serves a purpose in helping students express themselves, and recently BCC students have used the organization to spread the word on the threats of global warming. The MassPerg student chapters are statewide, so there are chapters all across the state and um, it's a nonprofit organization and basically what it does is it gives students a stronger voice because they're able to connect with each other all across the state and then like we as staff work on behalf of student interests like what issues they feel are important they pick the issues that they work on on their campuses and that what they want us to work on as well and global warming is such an important issue to students all across Massachusetts and all across on the state so we've been working on different issues like educating um, students on campus working to make campuses more sustainable and then also um, trying to get politicians to do their part as well and part of the table today is to um, gather pe um, petition signatures to help pass the global warming solutions act recently the bcc massperg chapter used a model home and model car to show the benefits of solar power Student David Villanueva says it's important to continue to discuss the need to diversify our energy resources. That there are other ways out there besides using fossil fuels and things that you know take millions of years to build up and then such a short amount of time to get rid of. You know, With uh, solar power it's renewable, it just keeps coming so we can just use it as much as we need and it's just a far more efficient way of uh, running appliances and houses and cars and there's tons of uses for it. Villanueva says the negative impacts of global warming appear to be getting the attention of students. I believe that students do grasp the idea and do trust that there is a problem with it. I just feel that most people, not just students, feel that it's more in the control of the politicians and the people that are more in power than students. But really students can make a difference just by voicing their opinion and really just grouping together and, and uh, you know, writing letters to people that are in power or, you know, just tons of ways for students to get involved with, you know, things like this. But how about college faculty and staff? Gerrither says they have also been supportive and proactive. We try to maintain very good relations with the faculty on campus. There's um, an energy task force where I know most of, the, most of the professors who are on it. And there's actually a lot of professors, at least in the science department, are very aware about global warming and are trying to make um, changes to make the campus more sustainable. Like, um, I think within the next couple months they're installing solar panels in the D building and the administration is working with faculty and um, each other to try to make the campus more sustainable. So we try to try to help with that and get involved with it and also act as a kind of a liaison between the students and the faculty. As students come to grips with the impact of global warming, Villanueva hopes the word will be transmitted to their parents. I think it's important for the older generations to understand too because they are also consumers. They use just as much as everyone else and they should also be concerned with how much resources they use in their lives until you know until their children are the ones that are in their position. For more information about MassPerg call the BCC campus at 
678-2811, extension 2557. Time now for our in-depth segment here on Around BCC. Bristol Community College has always been very accommodating to all students to afford everyone the opportunity to higher education here at BCC. And that uh, encompasses many different departments on campus, including those with disabilities. The Office of Disability Services handles the needs of the disabled and helping them succeed here at Bristol Community College. And we're going to talk about the Office of Disability Services today with its director, Jan Baptist. Jan, thank you for joining me today. You're welcome. Happy to be here. Um, the Office of Disability Services, in, in a nutshell overview, how does it service the disabled students here on campus? Well, we like to uh, refer to students with disabilities um, rather than the disabled students. We talk about um, the student and um, so therefore we look at every single student who comes through and discloses that they have a disability and that they would um, request services as an individual and we meet with them individually look at their documentation and from there decide what it is they need to be able to access higher education to be successful and um, we move we go from there I have a, a very um, wonderful hard-working staff I have learning specialists and disabilities counselors and they are very trained in knowing how to read documentation and that, that because that's the prerequisite you have to have um, documentation mm -hmm. that um, proves and states that the student has a disability and requires accommodations to level the playing field so to speak. Right. Is all that vetted out during the enrollment process when it a student is. comes in to right. seek classes or seek right. uh, acceptance into an academic program that's all? Actually it's not in the enrollment or admissions, it's actually in the registration process okay. where it gets vetted. Once a student has been admitted, a student comes through for our, a placement testing and we ask them, we, we give all students who register for any courses the opportunity to disclose a disability. I'm, I'm proud of that. We are working on that, even getting that now for students who register on the internet mm -hmm. uh, via the web. So they are, everyone has an ability and the time and the opportunity to disclose a disability and then we um, access, we reach out to them and, and send them letters and make calls and say, you disclose when you registered and we're happy to help you, would you come in and meet with one of the learning specialists? Mm -hmm. So we spend a lot of energy trying to make sure that every student on campus understands that we exist and that we're here to help them get their accommodations. Now, uh, it, once you get that, that documentation that, that students have a, 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 a disability, be a learning mm -hmm. disability or, or, or others, um, you, there's, there's some testing that happens that takes place. No, the documentation is the testing that's okay. done by a neuropsychological um, tester, someone who separate has, from the college. Separate from the college, they okay. come already tested. We don't, we're not able to do that. It, it takes licensure, and um, you know, it's a, it's certified testers sure. that ha that have the ability to do that. Uh, during a course of uh, even a semester, do you sometimes receive? Uh, calls from faculty that right. said, you know, we have a student that right. may have slipped through the cracks right. in, in some ways. And they Absolutely. May need we get calls and what we'll do is um, we actually want this, the faculty to have a conversation with the student. We have a form that we call Request for Academic Needs Assessment. We try to stay away from any kind of labels. So when I am um, meeting with division chairs and division and department chairs and faculty through a various um, uh, venues on, ca on the campus, I let them know that we are really looking for them to um, request academic needs assessment. So if a student is in their class and the student is working very hard, but their progress is not um, concomitant or um, commensurate with the effort that they're putting in, mm. we say, you know, why don't you have a conversation with a student to see um, if they there may be something going on that we need to learn about. Mm -hmm. So we call it the Request for Academic Needs Assessment and uh, we ask the faculty member to make sure that they discuss it with the student. What we're trying to do is get away from labeling, always sure. getting away from labeling. And sometimes faculty, not thinking, may say to a student who isn't um, getting the grades that they expect them to get, I think you may have a learning disability. Well, that is absolutely um, not called for. We don't want that to happen because sure. Once you say that, you've, you've sort of let the student feel that maybe 
they have a disability when they really don't. Yeah. So we are the, um, the Center for Developmental Education, which is our division here, under which the, direct, the disability office is housed. Um, we do a lot of assessment. We, we meet with a student. I do as the assistant director of the Quest program. I meet with a student, maybe do a little interview, and then refer them to the appropriate services. And it could be that, it, that disability service is the service, mm -hmm. but it could be just time management. It could be the connection center is the better place for them to go. Mm -hmm. Or it could be that uh, tutoring is what they need. Mm. Are, are there, and I'm not looking for hard and fast numbers, uh -huh. but are there a percentage of, of, of students that, that fall under the purview of your office? Oh, and, yeah. Well, uh, what, I, I how, could tell you, range? every semester we have a, um, about 500 students that we're actively working with. Mm -hmm. There are probably more that are not disclosing. And right. uh, that's a, another thing for students coming out of the high schools, K through 12. They really are tired of being labeled or being mm -hmm. um, moved out of the classroom for their services. So they don't disclose. They're not, they don't readily disclose. But yeah. I would say it mirrors what's happening in the community. It's about 20% of our population has some sort of disability. Right. What are some of the, the tools, and physical and otherwise? Mm -hmm. You talked about your staff, and we'll get mm -hmm. into that a little bit mm -hmm. later. But what are some of the, some of the physical tools that uh, those who seek services from your office can, can take well, part Well, I guess in? you're looking for the assistive technology, technology that we lab, have. Right. And, and really, we're really trying to bro grow and promote that. Um, there's two uh, areas that students need help with. One is reading. Mm -hmm. And we have the um, assistive technology that's called the Kurzweil 3000. And the Kurzweil 3000 is a software program with a scanner. Um, and whatever reading assignments the students have, we scan the reading assignment, whether it be the whole textbook mm -hmm. or a handout the inf instructor gives. The scanning process allows, goes directly to the computer, and then the software um, reads out allowed um, mm. what the reading material is saying and mm. there's a, a cursor that moves along in yellow and it's highlighted so the student can pace uh, with the reader mm -hmm. um, on the screen so that's for students who are having difficulty reading um, many students have difficulty writing and expressing their ideas and we use uh, what we call JAWS a, a dragon dictate that is the one that's been around for the longest and a student puts a microphone on and speaks into the microphone and the computer captures on a, in a Word document what the uh, student is saying. Mm -hmm. Right now, anybody who has Expedi uh, Windows XP on their computer has the ability, has speech recognition software. Mm -hmm. I'm learning how to do it myself because mm -hmm. they say that it boosts your production about 200% rather than typing and, and mm -hmm. writing. So. Um, I see that in the f near future as something that everybody's going to be using and that brings me to the idea of universal design for learning which um, the Office of Disability Services is very big on. Mm -hmm. If faculty design their classrooms using um, visuals and kinesthetic hands-on kinds of learning and share their notes with the students then uh, our students will be able to manage in the classroom just like all the others. It would be beneficial for all students. Mm -hmm. So we call that universal design for learning. Just like the curb cuts that are there right. for students Absolutely. with uh, wheelchairs, mm -hmm. women with uh, baby carriages and elders with shopping carts, they use those curb cuts and it makes life er easier. Right. So universal de design for learning is saying that if we design the classroom in such a way, everybody can participate and use all of the services that students with disabilities have been using for years. Mm. There's also uh, some, some opportunities for students to get help within the classroom. There's uh, note takers mm -hmm. for students and also uh, American Sign Language right. uh, interpreters available. Right. Um, is, is that something that's, again, something that is, um, is well used by students here Well, on certainly stu our students who are deaf or hard of hearing, who, who know American Sign Language, mm -hmm. Uh, utilize interpreting services and we have quite a, a large budget for interpreting services. We have currently this semester five students who are deaf who mm -hmm. have um, our full time and they're going after really higher uh, types of, of uh, courses so they're in engineering courses and science courses and higher, ed ma higher math courses and interpreting is um, quite a, a challenge for these students uh, but they utilize it and they're being very successful. And in addition to um, the interpreters for the student for students with, who are deaf or hard of hearing, mm -hmm. we have C-print captionists where right. there's actually someone in the classroom with a laptop, and they capture the 
the lecture in virtual time, mm -hmm. and the lecture is, sh is, sh is shown on the screen, so the hearing impaired person can see what's going on in the class at that moment. Mm. These are all things that are expensive, but we, uh, we have agreements with Mass Rehab um, and other agencies to help fund some of this, and we're, you know, we're always trying to manage that. Note takers in the sure. classroom, too, is another thing. Mm -hmm. We're always looking for students who are good at note taking. To, and we pay them a stipend or we pay them by the hour to sit mm -hmm. in the class and, and capture the lecture for the student. Is it important that, that some of the note takers have some knowledge of, of, of the course as, as sort of a background? It's, it's, yes, it is. It makes the note taking better and it, makes, it improves the quality of the notes. And we have some training. Anybody who's, who's um, hired by us to be a note taker is trained. Mm -hmm. And we work closely with the tutoring center to, to um, identify uh, students who can take notes. Mm -hmm. the, many of our tutors are also note takers. Talk about the uh, the PASS program. The PASS program is a very exciting program that we um, ha have because of a grant that we wrote with the Department of Education. Um, BCC has a lot of services and grants for students who are full-time, mm -hmm. but many students with disabilities uh, don't take full-time courses and they're not eligible for some of those support programs. So we recognized uh, many years ago that we needed some f uh, other resources. So um, st students who have um, s disabilities and they can really only be taking part-time classes can uh, um, assert themselves of the of the PASS program and there's two or three different levels. We have mentors for those students. Mm -hmm. Mentors are students who are trained to mentor uh, and they meet with the, the PASS students you know as needed or once a week um, and how we get the mentors is a leadership institute that we have that past students can participate in. It's mm -hmm. a four uh, modules and all of the past students are invited to participate and they come and they learn about advocacy skills, they mm -hmm. learn how to manage a higher education um, environment, they learn about the laws, disability laws, mm -hmm. they learn about time management, they learn about the assistive technology. Right. And when they graduate from that leadership academy, they can become mentors. Mm -hmm. So we try to have the mentors out of uh, the students themselves. Right. Um, and that's a, uh, that's a great skill to learn even mm -hmm. It's, after it's, it's right. It's life, it's life skills. It's yeah. advocacy. How, how they are going to manage their disability after they graduate from college. One, one last uh, question. Um, the Office of Disability Services also has a presence, I would assume, in the New Bedford campus right. and the Attleboro campus yes, it does. as well. If people have questions about, because uh, we only had a tip of the iceberg in our short right. time here, any questions about your office and, and how it services students, how can they get in touch with you? Well, I guess if there are questions about how to see a learning specialist, they can call the, the main office number, which is 2955. Right. Am I right about yep, that? Yep, 2995, <laughs> yeah. Yep. 2995? Yep, I believe uh, 2955. I think it's 2955. It's 2955. 508-678-2811, It's on the screen, so it's not a problem. So, so people can, can see it. Great. And um, they can, uh, but if it's a question about uh, services that they think they want to speak to the director, they can call me directly at my extension, 2319. 2319. Well, Jan, thank you for, for joining us, and I'm sure we'll talk about your office and the great work you do uh, in, in the future. And we I have a lot of things going on, and I'd be looking forward to talking right. to you about them. Jan, thank you very much. Up next on Around BCC, we're going to take a look at our next alumni in your community. Hi, I'm Bruce Rose. I'm a graduate of Bristol Community College, class of 1970. Hi, I'm Cynthia Rose, graduate of Bristol Community College, also the class of 1970. I first heard about Bristol Community College through a friend of mine who worked in the supermarket with me at that time. Uh, and he was uh, <clears throat> attending Bristol Community College. And, and I was graduating from uh, Evening High School, New Bedford Evening High School. And uh, he had suggested to me, or he had asked whether or not I was going on to college. And I said, uh, no, of course not. You know, I don't have any money. And uh, I didn't think, you know, I was college material. I didn't think I was smart enough. When I was meeting with uh, the recruiter, uh, she had asked me what it was that I'd want to major in. I had no idea 
what you would major in in college. Um, understand, nobody in my family had ever been to college. And so I asked her, well, what do you have? And she went down the list of majors, and she got to marketing, and I figured I was working in a supermarket at that time. Well, sign me up for marketing, and that's how I became a marketing major. When I was in high school, my best subject in high school was math and bookkeeping, and I always got straight A's in, in math and bookkeeping, so I decided that that would suit me to go to college to major in something like accounting. Through being at Bristol Community College, the guidance I got there was overwhelming, and they instructed me as to what courses I should take, and I followed it through, and you know, I took wonderful electives, and all my instructors, they were, they were great, and they reinforced that I could do it, and um, I felt very comfortable there. It was a good fit for a non-traditional student to go to college. After I, after I graduated from uh, BCC, <clears throat> I went to UMass Amherst. Once I got to UMass Amherst, it seemed that every two years my academic goals seemed to change. I, <clears throat> after I got my bachelor's degree, I pursued my master's and then ultimately my uh, doctorate. Well, in the middle of my uh, doctoral studies, I had applied for a position uh, with the Board of Higher Education and uh, <clears throat> ended up taking a, a position with the Board of Higher Education back in 1979. And uh, that was the beginning, the, the <clears throat> part of the beginning of my academic career. And from there, I moved on to uh, uh, an institution. I left the, the Board of Regents and went to work for an institution in uh, New Jersey and then came back to Massachusetts uh, and became vice president for academic and student affairs at Roxbury Community College. And now I find myself at UMass Dartmouth as assistant vice chancellor for academic affairs. I had a friend who wanted to take a civil service exam. This is after me working in the field for about seven years. And it, she didn't want to go to take it alone. So she asked me if I would go with her and I ended up going with her and I took the test and I did pretty well. I became a police officer and police officers make more money if they have an advanced degree other than an associate's degree. So I applied for, to go to school at Salve Regina in Newport and I did work major crimes so I was at court more so than the normal police officer who was in uniform. When you work major crimes you have to go to court quite a bit. One of the people that is still there, he explained to me that they were going to have an opening for an assistant clerk magistrate and if I would be interested in applying. And I said, gee, I really like my job. I, I really don't think so. And um, he said, well, you know, you have the personality, you know, you have the criminal law background. I think you would be really good for this position. And then I thought about it and I said, everybody at the district court level, there's no person of color that represents the people that we deal with in the city, and we deal with a lot of people of color. So then I said, I I'm going to go for it, and I'm going to try to to get this position. And I did end up getting the job, and it's been 10 years, and I, and I love it. We had always known one another, and when we ended up at Bristol Community College, it was, we really didn't think about it. We just, this was somebody I knew from the community. And, uh, in fact, I used to ride up to school with, with Cynthia. I used to borrow, Cynthia. yeah, I'm sorry. I used to borrow my mother's car and, yeah. and Bruce would, would ride up with me. And Cynthia uh, was also my accounting tutor. She helped me get through accounting, uh, which I struggled with when I was at BCC. One day I just thought it'd be nice for us to, to go to dinner, so I invited her to dinner. And next thing you knew, uh, <clears throat> the relationship started to get taken to another level, and uh, I finally asked her to marry me. But it took five years. <laughs> it took five years. That was my way of paying her back for having tutored me so, so well. And but I always tell him he owes me for what he has, because if it wasn't for me helping him in accounting, he wouldn't have got out of there, or it would have been a lot harder, I should say. Both Bruce and Cynthia Rose understand the importance of giving back to BCC. Bruce once served as a board member on the Alumni Association. 
Cynthia served as a school committee member in New Bedford and currently sits on the college's board of trustees. It's a new semester and that means new content from our BCC TV club. Here's their latest installment of Student to Student. Hello and welcome to Student to Student. I'm Ben Farabini. Today we have with us Jared Wilson, one of the students submitting a film into this year's film festival being held here at BCC. Hello Jared and welcome to the show. Well thank you Ben, thank you for having me. Uh, it feels great to be in such an, an inspiring room. It's, it looks just like a film studio and when I look around I just say, you know what? This would be a perfect place to film a film. Now, Jared, when is this year's film festival being held? Well, you see, the film festival we're having this year is being held on May 8th of 2008. And per se, it happens to rain that night, which would be a, a sad, sad moment in my life because I've worked so hard to, to put together such a wonderful product. Uh, we'd end up holding it the next day on May 9th, which would be just another great night as long as it didn't rain because then you could see what a wonderful product I worked so hard to put together for everybody to enjoy. Where will the film festival be held? Now, if you want to see this wonderful microcosm of creativity, you want to come to the grassy field outside the Margaret L. Jackson Art Center, which is a place of irony because we're working so hard to put together works of visual art, and now we're all going to gather in front of the Art Center to enjoy it. Now, if they decide to change it, it might be right here in this wonderful studio that we sit in. Okay, now when are the uh, submissions due for this film festival? Now, if you're sitting here watching this right now and thinking to yourself, well, gosh, I could put together a movie and, and make a wonderful product and submit it and, and show m people my talent, well, then, just to let you know, you need to send your submissions in by April 11th of 2008. That's a Friday, and you've got to get it in no later than 3 p.m. Because after three, after three o'clock, they're not gonna accept any more entries from you because they need to work hard to splice together all these films and make a wonderful product to show everybody on our showing date, May 8th. Now, as we mentioned earlier, you're submitting a film into this film festival. Tell us about your submission. Well, you see, I, I don't wanna ruin anybody's expectations or, or ruin my, I just don't want to take away from what my movie's all about, but I'll give you a general idea of the type of movie I'm submitting and the, and the type of plot that goes along with it. Because, I mean, I don't want to talk about it all now because then nobody's going to come see it, and that would just ruin the whole point. Now, you see, my movie is about a gentleman who's a little down on his luck. He had some gambling problems, so he, did, he meets up with a friend and talks to the friend, and they decide, you know what, we need some money because we're in debt, so we're going to get together and... Well, rob a bank. So they go about doing this, and then the partner that worked with the main character ends up deciding that he wants all the money for himself. So you know what he does? He stabs his friend in the back. Sounds very interesting. What inspired your submission into this year's film festival? Now, talking about what inspired me, it's no real inspiration. I mean, I just always enjoy seeing those movies about people getting into fire, people robbing stuff, and then they, they always end up, they try and get away, but you know what, it, it never works. And you know, I just want to put my own spin on it, and you'll see that there's some foreshadowing, there's some irony, and there's just a little bit of everything in it. And I, I think it will really be enjoyable. So specifically what inspired me, I, I guess my imagination, all, all the wonderful things I got swirling around up here. I see. Now what do you want your viewers to get from your submission? Well, what I want my viewers to get from this wonderful piece I'm trying to piece together is I, I just want them to get something that they enjoy, you know? See examples of how people interact with each other and see how not every friend is your best is best best friend. And I just want them overall to just enjoy this movie and just have a good time, you know, pull up some popcorn, some soda, and just have a ball. Okay, thank you, Jared. I appreciate you coming down and talking to us about the film festival. That's all for this segment of Student to Student. I'm Ben Farabini. See you next time. That's all for this month's edition of Around BCC. I'm Keith Tebow. Thanks for watching.